scripture today, but a good starting point will be 2 Kings chapter 22, verses 9 through 10. 2 Kings 22, 9 through 10. Second Kings chapter 22, verses 9 through 10. Is everybody well? Good. All right. Is everybody sad? Be honest. You're looking a little sad out there. Not you, Charles. You look happy. <laughs> She's here for the ride. Second Kings 22, 9 through 10. Happy to read that for you. It says, Then the court secretary, Shaphan, went to the king and reported, Your servants have emptied out the silver that was found in the temple and had given it to those doing the work, those who oversee the Lord's temple. Then the court secretary, Shaphan, told the king, The priest Hilkiah has given me a book, and Shaphan read it in the presence of of the king. Let's pray together. Lord, stir up our hearts to worship. Whether we're tired from the holiday season, maybe we're recovering from sickness, or maybe it's been a challenging week that was behind us, we ask now that you fill us with joy, fill us with eagerness to worship, and let us be meditative contemplating your word here this morning. And I pray that it changes us, that when we hear it, that we are resolved to be obedient to it and help me preach it, proclaim it. And let us always, as a church, be excited about your word, excited about gathering together. Let our fellowship be warm, let it be strong. And Christ, we must lift you up this morning. You are worthy of that. That is why we gather, is for the worship of Jesus Christ. And so we do worship you for who you are. We worship you for your good works on the cross and your victory over the grave. Let that be what fuels us as we go into this new year, that the gospel is everything, that we are eager about it, happy about it, that we want to know Jesus more. And So let this sermon be helpful towards that end. Be with me as I preach. Be with me as I love on my church family. In Christ's holy name, amen. As you picked up in my prayer, no doubt, this is usually the time of year where we like to sit down and list off our New Year's resolution. And I'm no different. I like to have a few goals in this approaching year. My goals are probably not different from yours. Maybe you're someone's got a little bit of a tummy and you want to get rid of it. You want to shed about 20 pounds or so. That's what I want to do. Maybe you're someone who would like to have your emergency funds a little bit bigger, right? Instead of having a few thousand in it that maybe you want tens of thousands. And if you got tens of thousands just laying on the side, hey, give me a call, all right? We can be friends. Maybe you're just wanting to develop a new hobby. Maybe you want to take up knitting, carving, something like that. Me, I want to read more books. I didn't read as many as I hoped last year, so this year I want to introduce a few more to my library. Now, here's the thing about resolutions. Sometimes we get them, we hit them, and sometimes we don't. There's been times where I've done really well with weight loss, that I was very slim. I would jog every night, eat fruits and veggies at every meal. There's been time I had more money than I normally do, and then there have been years where I read a lot of books, but there were years where I didn't, right? There were years where I didn't lose the weight that I wanted. There were years where uh, maybe I could get a McDonald's sandwich that day, depends what the bank account tells me. And then there were some years I didn't read as much as I would like. And so our commitment to these resolutions, if we're honest, they ebb and flow. Sometimes we're committed to them, sometimes not so much. Now, here's the thing I noticed in hindsight, when I look back, when I failed to meet these resolutions, nothing major really happened. You know, if you only lost 10 pounds instead of 20, that's still pretty good and probably wouldn't have made a world of difference either way. 
Maybe if you have 6,000 instead of 7,000 in the bank, okay, it'd be nice to have another 1,000, but well, in the end, not really going to amount to a big difference, right? Or if I didn't read all those books, I got another day in which I can read them. You, you see what I'm saying? We often make resolutions that really don't have a lot of lasting impact. They might make us feel good for the time being, but really, are they of any eternal consequence? Some resolutions can be, but more often than not, we make resolutions that don't really matter when it comes to eternity. And that's why I want to read about a king, a king by the name of Josiah. And what Josiah was mostly known for in the Bible was the great reforms that he brought back to the people of God. That he did a lot of things and made a lot of changes, not only in his life, but in the nation's lives that helped them get back towards God. And so what I want to do is I want to look at what he did and take those same principles and maybe even some of the same practices and put them in our lives, put them in our church life. And I believe that these are true resolutions, resolutions that really matter and will shape us for eternity. And there are four things that we did because we're talking about Josiah's reform. I'm going to keep the letter R going with all my points, right? So the first one is read, read, read what? The Word of God, obviously. That we're going to see what happens when Josiah and the people of God discovered the law of God and how that spirals a change in their community. Secondly, we're going to talk about repentance, turning away from evil, going in one direction, changing our mind, and going in the other direction, the correct direction. Third, remove. That there were things in the kingdom that could not remain. That there's things in our lives that we need to get rid of. Things that are displeasing to God and maybe we've been blind about them. Maybe we've been lying to ourselves, fooling ourselves into thinking that they were okay. But then finally, we're going to talk about restoring. Because it's not about just removing all the bad things, but it's also introducing the things that need to be in your life. Not only you as individuals, but us as a church. Here at First Baptist Church, we all need to be committed to reading, repenting, removing, and restoring. Because Josiah's reform is what we're looking for in our lifetime. Basically, what we are trying for is a revival. Reform and revival are somewhat like synonyms, and so they mean the same thing. Now, here's a warning from Leonard Ravenhill. Leonard Ravenhill will always chew you up and spit you out whenever you read his books. He says this, The only reason we don't have revival is because we are willing to live without it. In other words, we're okay without it. We don't need it. We're not looking for it. That is the only reason why God is not moving in an amazing way in our midst because we're okay with him not. We have been content with the mediocre. We have been content with the everyday pleasures of our lives. We've been content with being bogged down with work, family, and all these other things while we have been neglecting the household of the Lord. The only reason we don't have revival is because we are willing to live without it. And so let's make a change. Let's make resolutions that really matter, that have lasting consequences, and that can help us love Christ all the more and be committed to his mission. So let's look at that first point one more time. Read in 2 Kings 22, 9 through 10. Like I said, I'm going to be a little bit all over the place. Bear with me. It says, then the court secretary Shaphan went to the king and reported, your servants have emptied out the silver that was found in the temple and have given it to those doing the work, those who oversee the Lord's temple. Then the court secretary Shaphan told the king, the priest Hilkiah has given me a book. And Shaphran read it in the presence of the king. King Josiah felt compelled to make some repairs 
temple. When you look at the kings of both Israel and Judah, most of them were guilty of doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. But Josiah is one of those who stands out. When you read about him in 2 Chronicles, you see that early on he had a great resolve to be a king like David. A David was a man after God's own heart, and so he wanted to draw closer to the Lord, and at one point he looked at the Lord's temple and said, no, nah, this ain't no good. This has fallen into disrepair, and it needs some work. And so he made the decree to bring about some work and repair the temple. Now, as the workers were carrying out his command, they came across something precious, something that was long forgotten. They had found the book of the law. And usually, according to God's command, the book of the law was supposed to be kept next to the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. But this is how bad it has gotten in their nation, that they would routinely remove the Ark of the Covenant from the Holy of Holies and replace it with idolatry. They would face, replace it with pagan practices. And so it was often pulled in and out, and maybe this book of the law in that process got lost, but it was required according to God's command to have the book of the law readily available to all the priests, but for whatever reason it was gone. However, when they were repairing the temple, they stumbled across it. So apparently the nation had long forgotten the word of the Lord. And this is easy to see considering that most of the kings of Israel, the kings of Judah were evil, were guilty of introducing pagan and wicked practices. Instead of becoming a holy people, they had adopted the ways of the surrounding nations and being ignorant of God's word left them in darkness. So what did they have at that time? They probably had some manuscripts here, there, maybe some oral tradition. They were trying to keep up some practices, but obviously they did not have it like they just do now, that they found an actual copy. And most people suspect that really what compelled them was the book of Deuteronomy, that when you look at Deuteronomy, many of the things that Josiah implements comes from that book. Now, fortunately, the high priest and court secretary took the book to the king. They found it, recognized it for what it was, and in his presence, Shaphan read the contents of the book. And two important positions, there are two important official positions that are mentioned in this. Hilkiah is the high priest, and of course, Josiah is the king of the land. Now, the high priest is the one who's responsible for the nation's religion, basically, and and the king was the overseer of everything, but he wanted to make sure that the nation was doing well. So this begs two questions. If the high priest was ignorant of God's word, what was the standard for their religion? They've been practicing religion. This is not an atheistic secular humanistic society this is a theocratic nation but that begs the question which theo which god which religion see if they didn't have the book of the law to help them they were just doing it according to what their whims their personal preferences, looking at the other nations and taking and borrowing and synchronizing it with what they did know about their ancient religion. Same thing with the king. If the king was ignorant of God's word, how could he know that God had what expected of him? What, or should I say that again? How could he know what God had expected of him? If he was to rule and reign justly, fairly as the king, but he didn't have the word of God, by what standard? By what standard was he ruling and reigning over the nation? Again, just making it up. However, he feels that day. Now, again, Josiah is one of the better ones. He's one of the good ones. And so he had some type of education. But clearly, obviously, since the Bible recorded this event, there was something significant about them finding the book of the law, suggesting they didn't know what the book of the law required of them. And because of that, they had fallen into spiritual darkness that they were struggling. 
And so what they were doing is that they were borrowing religion from their neighbors. They had become like the other nations. And God routinely warned them, you are to be distinct, you are to be holy, you are not to be like them. And so the resolve that we are to have as individuals and as a church is to read the word of God, my friends. Because if you are not steadfastly, routinely, habitually in the word of God, by what standard are you governing your life? If we as a church are not leaning on the word of God, how do we even know what it is to be a church? Because what I'm seeing in America today, especially in many churches, we are seeing basically churches giving up the preaching and teaching of God's word in exchange for entertainment, in exchange for being relevant. And we see a lot of Christians who are ignorant of what I'm telling you, and this blows my mind, given all the resources that are out there, there are so many free classes you can take online. There are so many free YouTube resources that are top notch. I mean, these are things that I'm sitting there looking at going, man, I wish I had these things in Bible college. I wish I had these things in seminary. If there's so many resources out there, it's almost to the point we don't need Bible colleges and seminary. If you want to be well versed in your Bible, you're living in a good time. But what's odd is that we're more ignorant before than ever. And see, that's one of my goals as a pastor. This is one of my personal resolutions. My goal is not to be an event coordinator for you, to always have the best vision and everything. You know what Jesus told Peter when he was reinstating Peter? He asked Peter, do you love me? And Peter's response was, of course I do. What did Jesus say? John 21, 17, one of the times he says this. He says, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. So that's what God's expectations were. Now, clearly, Peter was a leader in the church. Clearly, he's a somebody in Christian history. And what did one clear command did Jesus give Peter? Simply feed the sheep. And what does he mean by that? Minister my teachings to them. Preach and teach them, love on them. See, so many times as a pastor, I get tempted to be, I want to be charismatic. I want to be cool. I, I want to be up to date on all and everything. I want to make sure that people are always happy. And I realize that's a fool's folly. You'll never make everybody happy. But one thing I can be faithfully committed to is preaching God's word. It's really that simple. Do you understand that? That all of our ministries, whether it's Sunday school, whether it's youth, whether it's children, whether it's whatever, all of it's to be grounded in God's word. And if it is not, then what is it? It's kind of like a show Kitchen Nightmares where Gordon Ramsay, he comes in and evaluates failing restaurants. And one thing that they always have in common is they got an overly complicated menu. That the menu is like this long. That there's tons of options for the customers. But here's the thing. They weren't good at anything that was on that recipe. And what he always does is he takes the recipe or the menu and makes it simple and keeps them focused just on a few dishes, a few entrees. That's what we need to be doing as a church. We need to really be looking at our calendar. We need to be looking at all of our activities and really ask ourselves, really ask ourselves, is this really grounded in God's word? Or is this something to keep us busy? Is this something to keep us looking like we're doing the Lord's work? Or is it genuinely grounded in God's word? So from the pulpit, what you're going to get from me in the new year is a dogged commitment to biblical sermons. Spending more time preaching the entire books of the Bible. You're going to get Nahum in a few months. This might be the first time you've ever read Nahum, but you're going to get it. From the pew, I'm going to be encouraging teachers in the church to have a deeper understanding of God's word. Taking James chapter 3 verse 1 seriously, not many of you should be teachers. That's what he says, not many of you should be teachers. Most of you should not. 
because you don't know your word and you're relying on other things to keep your ministry going. From the pew, I want you all to be into the word, in your household, committed to reading scripture together, that this isn't the first time that you read the Bible in the course of this last week, that this isn't the first time you've opened it up, but that you are digging into it on a regular basis, growing so that you can see true change and reform in your life and in the church. Secondly, let's talk about repentance. 2 Kings 22, 11 through 13, we'll read that first. Then we're going to jump into the next chapter. It says, notice the king's action. When, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Then he commanded the priest Hilkiah, Ahiakim, son of Shaphan, Akbar, son of Micaiah, the court secretary Shaphan, and the king's servant Asiah, go and inquire the Lord for me, for the people, and for all the Judah about the words in this book that has been found. For great is the Lord's wrath that is kindled against us because our ancestors have not obeyed the words of this book in order to do everything written about us. And so there are only two ways in which you can respond to God's word. You understand that? You either obey or you disobey. That when the word is commanded to you, and this is what God told the Israelites, I'm presenting before you life and death. Choose this day, right? We see that routinely offered to them in the Old Testament. Nothing has changed. Today, when you're hearing the word being proclaimed, you can either disobey or you can obey. Now, disobedience is those who hate the firestorm of preaching and roll their eyes at it. Obedience looks like Josiah. He heard God's voice, and in anguish, he tore his clothes. That was an old Jewish way of demonstrating your heartbreak, demonstrating your repentance. The word of God served as a mirror, and in it, the, Saul, the king saw his own reflection, and he saw the reflection of the nation, and the reflection revealed that they were kindling the wrath of God, meaning that the wrath of God is a fire, and they're adding wood to it, that they are routinely making it worse and worse. He looks at the word of God, looks up at himself, looks up at everything around him and says, oh my, we are not where we are supposed to be. We are not doing what God has called us to be. <coughs> Repentance. They had been wrong for a very long time. Josiah repented and he was going to take the nation with him in his repentance. And, and that's always a question that people ask me. I get approached on a regular basis about people wanting to go deeper in their faith, wanting to grow in the Lord. And they're like, I don't even know where to begin. I'll tell you, repentance. Repentance is always a good spot to start. Now, here's the thing. The Bible teaches you repentance. See, I wondered about the order of things. What comes first? Do you repent? And then you dig into the Bible. But here's the thing. If you repent without the Bible, what standard are you repenting against? <laughs> what are you repenting of? Only the Bible can clarify that for you. And so after you dig in into God's word, have a spirit of repentance. See where you are not, see where you are, and adjust accordingly. And that's what Josiah did. But here's the thing. True repentance is not simple declaration. Just saying it out loud. Standing in front of everyone at the altar and saying, I felt bad because I did something this last week. Josiah put it into clear, concrete practice. All the leaders of Judah were gathered. Let's look at verses 23 or chapter 23. And I forgot what verses, so allow me to turn the page. 1 through 3, I was right. 2 Kings 23, 1 through 3, this is what he did. So the king sent messengers, and they gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. Then the king went on to the Lord's temple with all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, as well as the priests and the prophets, all the people from the youngest to the oldest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. Next the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant in the Lord's presence to follow the Lord and to keep his commands, his the decrees and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul in order to carry out the words of this covenant that were written in this book. All the people agreed to the covenant. And so what did he do to demonstrate his true act of repentance? All 
the leaders of Judah were gathered. Whether they were royalty, whether they were priestly, they came together, they convened at the temple, and everyone was brought out, all the way from the oldest, all the way to the young old town, and the little one, to be quiet and pay attention. God's word is being proclaimed. That's what was expected. It wasn't expected just of the king to make changes. It wasn't just expected that the high priest was to make changes. Every single person in the nation was witnessing this and were expected to renew their covenant with God. They were a people repenting. And here's the great thing about repentance. A lot of prayers, when you ask them, you don't know how God is going to answer those prayers. You just don't. Sometimes he'll answer it in a way that you hope. Some ways he answers it in a way that you weren't expecting. Or he just flatly tells you no. But one thing that we have assured to us from Scripture is that any time we have a broken heart before the Lord, he moves towards us. Every time. And so that is one prayer you can have great confidence in. You don't have to sit there and say, well, Pastor Seth told me I should repent, and I want to go to the Lord of repentance, but what if he doesn't receive me? You don't have to wonder about that. Not at all. Listen to Joel chapter 2, 12 through 13. And by the way, this is in the height of their rebellion. This is what he says, even now. Even now, this is the Lord's declaration. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Tear your hearts, not just your clothes, and return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and he relents from sending disaster. See, there wasn't a point where he said they're too far gone, or I won't spare at all. He won't look at you and say, well, you're 80% evil and 79% is my max. But even now, and and what does Joel warn us? It's not just an outward, ripping your clothes, oh, I feel bad, uh, but a genuine change of heart, of repentance. So what would this look like? Well, being honest about our failures. Being honest. Where are we failing as a church? Where are we failing as a church? It's not easy to answer. Sometimes it is. But we can't just move along thinking, oh, we're doing everything just fine. Are we? Some things, yes. Some things, no. We have to be honest. Are we reaching out to the community? Really? Are we? Are we? Do you even want to? That's a question you have to Do you care about people going to hell? Do your, does your life suggest that you do? Are we loving one another? Are we practicing our spiritual disciplines, the fasting, the weeping, and mourning? Are we truly Christ-centered? Is why you gathered here this morning was to experience Christ? Was it really? Or is it habit? It's where my friends are. It, it makes me feel good, gets me out of the house. Oh, there's a number of reasons you can come to church that aren't Christ-centered. See, repentance requires you to be really honest with yourself, to look in God's law, peer into it deeply, and say, teach me about myself. And where I am right, encourage me. Where I am wrong, convict me and correct me. Secondly, remove. Let's look at 2 Kings 22, 4 through 16. Nope, 23, 4 through 16. All right, sorry about that. 2 Kings 23, 4 through 16. What's funny, it's what's written down on my paper, but I still got it wrong. 23, 4 through 16. Then the king commanded the high priest Hilkiah and the priests of the second rank and the doorkeepers to bring out the Lord's sanctuary. All the articles made for Baal, Asherah, and all the stars in the sky. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. Then he did away with the idolatrous priests the kings of Judah had appointed to burn incense at the high places in the cities of Judah in the areas surrounding Jerusalem. They had burned incense to Baal and to the sun, moon, constellations, and all the stars in the sky. He brought out the Asherah Pro from the Lord's temple. Do you see that? The Asherah pole, which was a, an object for worship, for false worship, was in the Lord's temple. 
but he removed it. He removed it from the Lord's temple to the Kidron Valley outside Jerusalem. He burned it at the Kidron Valley, beat it to dust, and threw its dust on the graves of the common people. He also tore down the houses of the male cult prostitutes that were in the Lord's temple in which the women were weaving tapestries for Asherah. Then Josiah brought all the priests from the cities of Judah and he defiled the high places from Jeba to Beersheba where the priests had burned incense. He tore down the high places of the city gates at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city on the left at the city gate. The priests of the high places, however, did not come up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem. Instead, they ate unleavened bread with their fellow priests. He defiled Topheth, which is in Ben Hinnon Valley, so that no one could sacrifice his son or daughter in the fire to Molech. He did away with the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun. They had been at the entrance of the Lord's temple in the precincts by the chamber of Nathan Molech, the eunuch. He also burned the chariots of the sun. The king tore down the altars that the kings of Judah had put on the roof of Ahaz's upper chamber. He also tore down the altars at Manasseh. These are former kings. Had made in the two courtyards of the Lord's temple. Then he smashed them there and threw their dust in the Kidron Valley. The king also defiled the high places that were across from Jerusalem to the south of the Mount of Destruction. Listen to this. Which Solomon, Solomon, king of Israel had built for Ashereth, the abhorred idol of the Sidonians, for Chemosh, the abhorred idol of Moab, and for Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. He broke the sacred p- uh, pillars and the pieces, cut down the Asher poles, and filled their places with human bones. He even tore down the altar at Bethel in the high place that had been made by Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. He burned the high place, crushed it to dust, and burned the Asherah. As Josiah turned, he saw the tombs there on the mountain. He sent someone to take the bones out of the tombs and he burned them on the altar. He defiled it according to the word of the Lord proclaimed by the man of God who proclaimed these things. Stopping there. And then when we look in verse 24, we see right there that he removes all the mediums, the spiritists, all the witches from the land. I mean, this is a very intolerant guy. Why is he not respecting their religion? So Josiah waged war against the false gods. Absolutely he did. They were being honored in his hand. Uh, He took on the Canaanite gods like Baal and Asherah. And these were Canaanite fertility gods that they actually had poles stationed up through the land where people, the people of God, were worshiping false gods. And Asherah poles were actually in the temple as well. God's holy temple had been defiled, in which the Ark of the Covenant was removed. What is really damning is that Solomon himself was responsible for introducing some of these practices. See, a big man's name was attached to it. So it's hard to remove Solomon. This is Solomon's, and it became a sacred cow to them. This is why many believe the scroll was read, came from the book of Deuteronomy, because that's exactly what God told the Israelites to do once they they entered into the promised land, to remove these things. Josiah was simply honoring God's original commands to the Israelis. Look at Deuteronomy 12, 1 through 4. Be careful to follow these statutes and ordinances in the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has given you to possess all the days you live on the earth. Destroy completely all the places where the nations you are driving out worship their gods. On the high mountains, on the hills, and under every green tree, tear down their altars, smash their sacred pillars, burn their Asherah poles. This is generations ago. Generations ago, they were supposed to do that. Cut down the carved images of their gods and wipe out their names from every place. Don't worship the Lord your God this way. Do you you see what he's telling them right there? Do not look at how the nations are worshiping and then borrow their practices and direct them towards me. See, the fear that God has, fear, if you will, that he has is not that they'll stop worshiping him, but what he is concerned about 
is that they will worship him like the pagans worship their gods. Borrowing from them and then introducing it into their worship services. He says, I've given you a way I want to be worshipped. I have told you the way I want to be worshipped. Do not look to the other nations and borrow from them and then implement it into your religion thinking that I'm okay with it. But that's what the average American church does on the regular. What will draw a crowd? Look at what that church did with all their theatrics, with all their coolness. They look more like a rock concert than they do like a sacred place of worship. And we're sitting there telling them, God's okay with that. We have a book. We have a Bible that tells us how God desires to be worshipped. And so are we guilty of the same thing? That the ancient Israelis, God tells them, this is the way I want to be worshipped. Yeah, I hear you, but we're going to look at how gods of like Baal and Asherah and Molech, how they are worshipped. We're going to take those practices and apply them to you. And that's what churches do all the time. They borrow something from the secular world, baptize it, and say, let's roll with it. Look how many people showed up. See, we got to remove things. See, that's when we have to be honest with ourselves. What are some practices? What are some things that we do? Some of the things that we believe that are flat out pagan, that are evil, that you think just like other people do, that you're no different from an unbeliever in the way that you live your life, the way that you live inside your mind. So you got to remove it. Just like they did that uh, cancer on my scalp, right? The initial tumor right there. That cancer right there, that tumor was basically a cancer-creating factory. And there would have been no point addressing the other parts of my body while that was still there. So they said, we're going to cut that out. And then we'll address the other things. See, and that's what we need to be doing. Remove practices that do not contribute to the mission, especially those that are truly unbiblical. And each one of you need to be sitting down looking at the Word of God and saying, are my beliefs, are they lined up with the Bible really? Or have I been shaped by the secular world? Am I more like them than I am like Christ? And then lastly, restore. Restore what? Well, what we see in 2 Kings 23, 21 through 23, after and in the midst of all this, it says this, that the king commanded all the people, observe the Passover of the Lord your God as written in the book of the covenant. No such Passover have ever been observed from the time of the judges who judged Israel through the entire time of the kings of Israel and Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, the Lord's Passover was observed in Jerusalem. And he started ruling when he was about eight years old. Do a little math and you get an idea how old he was. And so here it is. If you find a rotten wood in your house, it is not enough to simply remove it, right? If you remove rotten wood from your foundation, your foundation is compromised. You must replace it with good wood. And yes, Josiah did that. Josiah destroyed all the false worship, removed all the pagan practices, drove out those who were steadfastly committed to these false gods. But he also had to restore something. He couldn't leave them empty, but he restored true worship. And what we see specifically is he celebrated their most cherished holiday, which is the Passover. Now they have observed Passover before, but the author makes it clear they hadn't observed it this way. They really made a big hullabaloo about it. They really made a big to-do about it. They were excited to be finally on the right track and to be worshiping God the way that he wants to. They were drawing closer to their God and they were finally becoming the people that they were called to be. See, worship should excite us. I'll say that again. Worship should excite us. Worship is what should be driving us as a church. Not just all these things that we got going on, putting off a lot of light but not a lot of heat. But we need to have hot worship. No? No? Yes? 
That is what we are called to do. Above everything else, the people are God about the worship of God. That is the sole reason for the existence of the local church. If you're not coming here to worship, go somewhere else. If you're not here to worship, repent. Go back because you've forgotten your first love. John 12, 32, Jesus says this. As for me, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Who's going to draw people to himself? Christ, right? We don't believe that. We don't. We think our cleverness is what drives people to Christ. Our coolness drives people to Christ. That our neat activities is what drives us to Christ. That's what we think. That if, are we afraid to remove, I, I, I do, I often wonder, I wonder if the average church, if they were to peel away all the entertainment aspects of the church, would they be brave enough to do it? And say, actually, we're just going to rely on God's prescription on how to reach people. I I wonder if most churches would even have the backbone because they would be afraid that, no, we'll lose people over that. But Christ said, if I'm lifted up, if I'm exalted on the cross, if my message is proclaimed, I will do the drawing. I will do the work. You just have to be concerned about worship. I will bring the worshipers. You make sure you have something for them. I'll bring the hungry. You make sure you feed them. Do we believe that? I don't know. It's kind of like that show I like to watch, My 600-Pound Life, personal documentary, right? (laughs) I like watching it. You've probably seen it. It's just a documentary about people who are morbidly obese, and you're watching their weight loss journey, and they go visit Dr. No, who's down somewhere in Texas. And he always has them come in, and he wants them to lose a little bit of weight. I've told you this before. He always requires them to lose a little bit of weight before he's willing to do the surgery, And this one lady, she came back. She was supposed to lose 50 pounds in a month. When you're that big, it's possible. Lose 50 pounds in a month, he said. And she said, okay. She went home and she said, well, here's my diet. I'm going to have protein shakes at uh, breakfast and lunch and something very lean for dinner. And she ate that and she came back and she only lost about 10 pounds. And he's like, what happened? And she told him, well, this is what I was eating every day. And he's like, "That's that's not the instructions we gave you. He's like, why didn't you follow our menu? I've been doing this a long time. I've met hundreds of people like you. Don't you think I know what I'm doing? That's how he talks to them. He's like, you just sat there and made up your own diet and look where it got you. Boy, is that not the average church. Just making up things as they go. Borrowing ideas from other places. Not going to God's word. To teach them, to teach them about repentance, teaching them how to remove things from their lives and also how to restore proper worship. Do you truly believe that God has told us how he wants to be worshipped? Why would he not? Something so important is that. You think he's silent on that? Of course not. So all we need to do is run to him to lead us and to guide us. We don't need the world. We don't need fallen ways. We need God with our whole hearts. Will you repent? Will you return to him? Will you remove the evil things in your life? Will you be grounded in word? And will you come back with worship? Our friends are going to lead us at this time. I apologize. I've gone a little over But I want you to respond to God's preaching. Come to the altar and pray. Pray with your friend, your spouse, whoever is next to you. And simply respond to the God's word the right way. Miss Roxanne. Would you stand please?
Thank you, and God bless you for being here today to quicken things. I'll ask Brother Charles, will you dismiss us in prayer, sir?